welcome to Living Mirrors with Dr. James Cook. My guest this week is Peter Schuster Hughes. Peter is a philosopher of mind who specializes in the thought of Whitehead, Nietzsche, and Spinoza, and fields pertaining to panpsychism and altered states of mind. Following his degree in continental philosophy at the University of Warwick, he became a philosophy lecturer in London for six years, after which he pursued a PhD on pansentient monism at the University of Exeter, where he's now a research fellow and associate lecturer. Peter is the author of Numenautics and a new book called Modes of Sentience. Today we discuss panpsychism, psychedelic consciousness, and nihilism. Hope you enjoy the conversation. Okay, I'm here with Peter Schuster Hughes. Peter, thanks for coming on the podcast. Thanks for inviting me. So maybe we can begin with uh, a bit of how you came to work at the intersection of, of philosophy and psychedelics, because that's how I first kind of came across your work, arguing for the value of, of altered states in, in philosophy. Right, well, I, I, I was teaching um, philosophy in London, a college in London, about, you know, well, since 2006 and um i sort of you know began specializing really in the philosophy of mind i suppose to some extent but i was roped into teach philosophy of religion and um that included a section on william james's varieties of religious experience wherein he talks about um well he makes as a sort of philosopher or psychologist philosopher he makes the first well one of the first connections between the mystical state in the religious canon and psychedelic induced states. And uh, at the time I was kind of, you know, quite a, you know, I was brought up in England and Sweden. So I was quite, you know, sort of by default, you become quite physicalist and uh, atheistic and so on and so forth. But I was quite intrigued by this because of philosophy of mind, um, you know, like in, in terms of altered states of mind. And um, and so I, uh, that piqued my curiosity and then <clears throat> I just happened to come across some uh, magic mushrooms in Cornwall where I live and, um, and uh, I took I took some, quite a few, and I had this well, as you know, um, all all inspiring experience. And then I thought, okay, I'll, I better look into this sort of philosoph- philosophical literature about this. And um, except for William James and and a few more, there's relatively little about it. So I um and then I sort of thought I'd make a stab at it and gave a talk on Bergson's philosophy in relation to it in 2013 at the Breaking Convention Conference, for example. And then since then, it's just sort of escalated. Right. And is it fair to say that you're kind of coming at this uh, with phenomenology being a kind of key tool that philosophers can use to to do their do their work, and therefore altered states are a useful part of that? Um, I, I think for, you know it must start with phenomenology. In other words, a kind of um, analysis of um, experience uh, and a detailed analysis beyond simply you know unity and and so on. Um, however, of course, you know, traditionally, in the traditional sense of phenomenology from, you know, Brentano and Husserl, uh, or Husserl especially, there's no uh, link, real link to ontology, or me- you know, metaphysics, broadly speaking. So I'm very interested in, in that as well. In other words, um, beyond experience, what, how does it relate to reality itself? And so, um, of course, yeah, one starts with phenomenology, one, there's no option but to do that, I suppose. But um, I like to... Um, I suppose my main sort of concern at the moment is um, ultimately the question as to whether a number of these psychedelic induced experiences can be considered, uh, you know, partly ver- veridical, like objectively real, or whether they are hallucinatory, and why, you know, how that judgment is made upon which um, ontology essentially. But that, of course, then brings in epistemology as well, the study of knowledge. You know, how do we know what we know and how what, what can we know and so on and so forth. So it's all really the interesting thing about psychedelics and philosophy is it's like um, it, it's kind of a magnet that brings together all these different aspects of philosophy in very sort of interesting ways. And that's why I think it's a good um, thing to study for philosophers ultimately, because it brings to light, you know, um, all these different aspects. Right. Yeah. It definitely seems like a portal to all these different these different questions. And you mentioned there, so to make sure everyone comes along uh, with what we're talking about, you, you mentioned kind of phenomenology and you know, which is experience, and uh, and then on the other hand, a link to ontology or metaphysics or the real what is reality made of, right? And in your, one of your books, it's called Numenautics, which is a, a fun combination of the word kind of psychonaut, I guess, and and noumena, this Kant's word for the thing in itself, the stuff that reality is is made of, and then. So as my, you know, not being a, a professional philosopher, my, my broad strokes understanding is you can't have this kind of phenomena, you have phenomena experience, and then you have the noumena, the stuff out there, you know, whether you want to say it's the stuff of quantum physics, or it has no real appearance, it's just this unknowable thing, right? But you were, you were drawing a link there from saying, from studying phenomena, you can kind of get to the 
I mean, maybe I'm making an unfair link between ontology and the thing in itself, and uh, you know, the noumena. But um, I wonder if, do you take a stance almost like Schopenhauer, where you have like, my understanding is that he felt by looking inwards and, exp and feeling your own will or desire, that is an example of, of a knowable thing in itself. And know, and, you know, the noumenon that you are, uh, you can know that through, through introspection. So you can make this leap from phenomena to the noumena world. Is that the kind of thing you're alluding, alluding to with, with noumenautics? Um, I suppose, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's the question, you know, rather than statement in that respect. So yeah, noumenautics, Newman, uh, my book from, um, as you say, noumenon from Kant, which meant the world in itself, like beyond experience. So we experience the world in a certain way, certain human way for Kant is quite radical. He's, he sort of said, you know, even space and time are projected um, upon the given. And uh, so we don't know, take away the mind, we don't know what reality um, is, is like in itself. It's the limit of human knowledge for Kant. Um, and then, yeah, the, the word psychonaut from Ernst Jünger, sort of a Nietzschean philosopher, he coined psychonaut. Um, but yeah, you're right that Schopenhauer says there is one um, way in which we can experience the thing in its, itself. He doesn't use the word noumena, um, which is rightly uh, the sort of the will. So that for him, the will to live, uh, the will to survive, which is this drive, which is subconscious, but it's akin to, you know, it's, there's legacy in philosophy with this from, from that to Spinoza's Canatus, you know, uh, the perseverance to survive, uh, to persist in one's being, and it goes all the way back really to Aristotle, final causes, you know. Um, but yeah, so, <clears throat> you know, there are claims, like William James then says that certain psychedelic experiences are noetic, which means that they have, at the time, in within the experience, uh, one has a sense that they are real, you know, perhaps that fades away when one sobers up but nonetheless within the experience itself there's this noetic element he's he writes and um i suppose what i was alluding to with the word pneumonautics um is that there might be ways of accessing um a reality that um perhaps psychedelics in other words break down a normal prosaic way of thinking or perceiving things and allow one for a greater um, intuition or grasping uh, some kind of apprehension of reality and this is where metaphysics comes in you know because if one um, rejects transcendental idealism Kant's metaphysics or non-metaphysics um, then if one rejects that and one accepts let's say you know standard physicalism then that such a noetic experience must be false it must be hallucinatory um, however, if one accepts that there's a reality out there which is unknown to us in normal consciousness or for human consciousness campers, then, you know, opens up at least the possibility that um, such experiences, akin to mystical experiences in the past, in the West, at least in the East, not so much in the Americas, but um, it opens up the possibility that there's more truth in these experiences, some experiences, than, um, than uh than some people think. And uh, this is why I'm sort of against, I don't like the word hallucinogen because it's sort of too loaded, you know, it's it kind of assumes that we know what reality is. And of course, hallucination is relative to reality. So um, I don't think we really do. I don't think anyone does really, you know, every single metaphysical position that one takes has, issue, has problems, you know, I don't know the answer really, our preferences, but, um, you know, if we don't know what reality fundamentally is, then we, we are sort of premature if we call things hallucinations. Halluc you know, obviously some are obvious hallucinations. You see a whale floating in your garden perhaps, but other others um, are more more open to uh, question, I think. Yeah, I think that's another thing as well. With hallucinogen suggests it's all about construction and delusion and seeing extra things. Whereas I think a lot of people find um, intellectual kind of insight comes through, or philosophical insight comes through deconstruction. So you were saying like, this, disassembling certain ways we tend to see the world perhaps through kind of linguistic constructs and so you know to me I, I take a, I guess a relatively Kantian view probably not quite as extreme but I do I think it's useful to think in terms of the noumena out there and then the phenomena you know that um and that they're, they're being kind of relatively separate things and from that perspective when when we're in a psychedelic state or even when we're in normal kind of consciousness yeah, I feel like we're never, I don't take the kind of Schopenhauer view that we're, we're really connecting with the, the noumenon um, when we when we introspect, but I feel like, I guess, you know, so 
again, my, my understanding is Schopenhauer, he, he used the word representation for the kind of phenomenal side of this, right? The kind of, the, the experience is representing something out there in the noumenal world and the thing in itself. And it feels, that feels useful to me because if you notice something like impermanence in your experience, you notice that there's a constant flow, constant flux. To me, even though you're examining phenomena, to me that that gives a very strong impression that the noumenal world must also be a constant process, a constant flux. Um, you can't necessarily prove that, but it, it feels very compelling, I think, when you uh, when you sit with impermanence. I mean, this is a huge foundation of a lot of kind of Buddhist thought as well, right? That through introspection, through seeing impermanence and phenomena, you can you get a very strong impression that metaphysically impermanence is a is a real foundational. Uh, thing as well and I think we both share a kind of pro maybe I mean would you say you're, you share, have a kind of process metaphysics that reality is this kind of ongoing yes. process yeah no I do I mean this comes from straight from Alfred North Whitehead for me at least um I don't know much about Buddhism so I don't know exactly how it corresponds to that but I I see certain parallels um yeah, so, you know, at the fun foundation of um, reality, um, there are only uh, drops of experience or occasions, uh, actual occasions of experience. And that's why Whitehead is also known as a pan-experientialist, the type of pan-psychist. This is the foundational level of all things. And this then leads to um, the sort of res resolution of um, other issues down the line, to a certain extent, like hard problems of consciousness and so on. And, um, yeah, so, so ultimately I would... Well, but with Whitehead, there's an interesting... Um, so another word for his, another term for his philosophy is organic realism, and he opposes that to representationalism, um, which the idealists, he says, are guilty of, um, which is that there's this, it's dangerous, I think, to say that, you know, there's our representation of the world and then there's the world outside as two kind of like a dual, duality there. And then the question is, how do, how do they interact? So this is a problem that Kant really can overcome with regard to causation as um, being something we project at the same time the outside given causes us to see things right so whitehead's got this interesting um ontology um based on what he calls prehensions which is that uh, at the fundamental level perception of something is the incorporation of that object inside of the subject so there's a fusion of object and subject and also a fusion of one's immediate past into one's immediate present there's a continuation and that integration is essential to the entity itself the, the the next occasion of experience without that um you have this problem in philosophy of um trying to connect the moments of time together um so so this is a way of also um overcoming hume's problem of causation which is you know he he writes that you know we can't perceive causation um, but for Whitehead, all perception is causation. All feeling is is causation. So perception is causation, and um, the subject-object dichotomy is not as um, dual as we often think. So, and this also takes us out of the possibility of solipsism, which is you know that only you know the belief that only your mind exists, and you can't prove that there's an outside world. You know, in the Barkellian sense. Um, because um, perception and the outside world are one, you know, they're not, they're not in, into, um, they're not bifurcated again. So Whitehead offers an interesting way out of um, a lot of uh, problems in philosophy. Historically, unfortunately, he was sort of um, hijacked by the uh, a Methodist kind of contingent in America, and they gave him this kind of theological um, flavor that um, didn't really go down well in Europe. Um, but this is a bit unfair when you read Whitehead, you see you know, there are Christian elements and he was an Anglican to start with, but then he turned agnostic and, um, and then essentially created his own kind of strange panentheism. And this is uh, documented, uh, as you mentioned, Numenautics, my new book, Modes of Sentience. There's a chapter on, on Whitehead's um, development here, so metaphysical development from Anglican, mathematician, in Cambridge, to philosopher of science, agnostic, to then um, process philosopher in Harvard. And um, I think that his philosophy can be really applied to the psychedelic experience in many interesting ways. Um, in terms of, for example, um, in terms of, for example, nature connectedness, you know, there are certain new studies, Sam Gandhi and these people who have shown, well, well have sought to show at least, that um, psychedelics can foster some kind of nature connectedness, some kind of affinity or sympathy with nat you know, natural objects like plants. Um, the question, the interesting question for me is, is this then hallucination? Because plants can't have any value, intrinsic value. Um, 
or is there some kind of veridicality to it? In other words, is there some truth in this nature connection, connectedness? Um, so Whitehead's philosophy does allow for the possibility of such a truth, again, because number one, everything is pan-experientialist, so plants have basic forms of sentience, not consciousness, as we know it, but basic forms, as the ancient Greeks believed. Um, and, uh, and the intuition of that is possible. He writes, you know, that we often actually do perceive feelings of other things around us, but um, we've evolved these traditional five senses, which kind of mask everything else. But our perceptual abilities are far greater than we are conscious of. And, um, and perhaps psychedelics allow for an amplification of these, of these sort of uh, primal feelings, as he calls them. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, on the, the question of, of whether plants can have value in of themselves, you know, I, I take this kind of, yeah, like a, a similar a biopsychist stance, I would say, where I feel that my consciousness is not the product of being a human or a mammal. I feel it's a product of being a living thing. And as a result, I feel a, a kind of a deep connection in the same way that I feel a connection to other humans and, you know, feel empathy and sympathy for them feel they have moral status. To me, that extends uh, throughout the natural world. And, and it feels very straightforward and, and, you know, just exactly the same process where you have kinship through being a mammal or a human, the same thing applies for all living systems. And it, it does hinge on this idea that, that systems can suffer. Mm -hmm. um, when you say plants uh, can't have a kind of value in themselves, is that, is that a stance that's just tied to the idea that they're kind of sentience, or is that something you you hold? Um, well, when I say plants do have value in themselves, what I mean by that really is, um, what, what I mean is, well, it's not based on, on, on any objective morality. It's rather based on just this pan-psychological view, essentially, which I get from Whitehead, but also Spinoza and others, um, that uh, they have their own... Well, what Schopenhauer would call will to will to live, will to survive, or the Spinoza, the Spinoza and Canatus, or the Nietzschean will to power. Even um, they have, in other words, their own in themselves, their own um, desire for survival. So therefore, sunlight and water and so on. They're not conscious of these things, obviously, but I assume there's, um, for parsimonious reasons, I assume there's some kind of delight in sunshine, for example. Of course, it's only an inference and it can't be, it's, it's not an empirical matter in philosophy of mind and metaphysics. You know, we have to go beyond um, the sort of epistemology of empirical proof. I mean, you know, if you, if you stick with empirical proof, you're left to solipsism ultimately, you know, you can just prove that it seems that, you know, you, your mind and your immediate surroundings are real, if that even. Um, so, and, you know, just like in mathematics, you don't rely on empirical proof your theorems so the same in metaphysics you know it just involves different kind of um epistemology so inference the best explanation through parsimony for example um so when i say that plants have uh, a, a sort of intrinsic value what i mean by that is that they have a sentience and the foundation of that sentience as view i take is um this this drive this fundamental subconscious drive as the great philosophers have always spoken of um now that, of course, then I think um, induces a kinship, as we're saying, you know, if you if you see the natural world in this way, it sort of changes your approach to it quite radically, I think, or it can do at least. Um, so and this is very much opposed to the sort of, um, I would argue, sort of modern Western post Cartesian view um, where where nature is seen as without any intrinsic value, but only of instrumental value to those with conscience, consciousness, uh, which are for Descartes, just humans, you know, because Descartes, of course, as you probably know, by, uh, split nature into two. So you had, you know, with humans, we had the soul um, and then everything else, including human body was extension, pure extension. So we defined matter purely in geometric terms. Um, and then, you know, religion took over the soul aspect in culture, at least, uh, you know, the saving of the soul. And science then plowed on with understanding nature in mathematical ways, which was very conducive to technology, of course, science, but also unfortunately then to industry. Um, and then, you know, leading to a sort of ecological uh, crisis that we have now, because I think part, part not to the sufficient reason, but part of the reason is um, if you only see nature as dead matter with that, without any intrinsic value in itself, then of course, you know, why not exploit it for that which is the only thing that has value? In other words, human souls. So this um, this is why Whitehead especially uh, picks on Descartes. Everyone picks on Descartes, Descartes <laughs> but um, 
in the early 20th century, Whitehead picked on Descartes for this sort of um, abysmal separation of mind from nature. And you see, you know, before Descartes, with, you know, even sort of scholasticism that's based on Aristotle, you see this sort of fusion of mind within nature. You see it in Plato, you see it in Aristotle and most of the ancient Greeks. Um, and, and this was lost in the, well, from the 1600s, really, in the West um, for industrial reasons and capitalist reasons, I suppose, working together. Um, but also in, you know, communist countries, of course, you know, with the materialism of Marx. Um, so why... So, you know, the solution to that really, as I see it historically, was Spinoza. So Spinoza saw, you know, mind and matter as different expressions of the one true, one substance that he called nature, but he also called it God. And that's what got him into trouble, partly. And that's why his philosophy was suppressed for over 100 years. And thus, we, we you know, um, we sort of rolled on with the Cartesian um, way of thinking about nature, which then led to where we are now. Uh, so, you know, one can regret that Spinozism wasn't really... Uh, wasn't really taken on. Interestingly, I just saw yesterday um, a uh, letter. This Spinoza, so Spinoza was excommunicated by his fellow Jews, and then his books were banned by the church in, um, you know, in the, in the mid 1600s. Um, but this great um, Spinoza scholar recently, well, he's making a film about Spinoza, and he, he wrote a letter to the uh, synagogue in Amsterdam, where Spinoza was based. And uh, and he got he got a reply only a few days ago saying, you know, uh, Spinoza was banned, and this ban this ban is eternal. And you have spent your whole life studying this this uh, Epicurean Epicurus, as they as they called it, in other words, sort of materialist atheist, which is not, not fair. Um, and uh, you are persona non grata. So even today, that sort of um, antagonism towards Spinoza and Spinozism uh, holds its place, you know. Yeah. Spinoza, of course, was also the first pantheist. You know, the word pantheism was named after Spinoza's philosophy by Joseph Raphson. So anyway, so um, and I see Whitehead as a kind of, in a way, a continuation of Spinoza. He sort of modernized Spinoza with evolution, evolutionary theory, process theory, ultimately. You know? um, and so, uh, yeah, so I think this is quite useful uh, philosophy, not just in terms of psychedelics, but also in terms of ecology today. Definitely. I mean, and the word, I should say, the word ecology was coined by Ernst Haeckel, the great artist and scientist. And he was, he tried to create a monistic religion based on Spinoza. So from the very start, ecology is, is interlinked with Spinozism. Right. But, it's, but it never took hold of the Western imagination, alas. Yeah, I feel um, a degree of familiar responsibility for that because my, my 12th great grandfather was... Uh, also kind of, so there were Portuguese Jews who were kind of forced out during the Inquisition and moved to Amsterdam. And he was one of the, he, the rabbis, one of the council that excommunicated Spinoza, which is my, my oh, really? claim to fame. Yeah. So my <laughs> direct great grandfather, my uh, maternal grand, paternal grandmother, her father's 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 father. Um, yeah. It was amazing when I came across a book with his name in it and, you know, he was the right age and everything at the time. And it was only a community of less than a thousand people. Um, and I, yeah, I couldn't believe it because I've always been a huge, I've hugely resonated with Spinoza and since I was a teenager and I didn't know this until a few years ago. Uh, and I, oh, wow. I agree with everything, everything you said in terms of if history had taken a different turn and we'd embrace Spinoza and stuff would, you know, the, if you're going to set up a, a dichotomy between um, Descartes and Spinoza, yeah, Spinoza could be the solution to the kind of ecological catastrophes that we're facing now. I think so. I think at the same time you need to modernize it a little bit um, with theory of evolution. I mean, evolution, th evolutionary theory is not, um, you know, uh, is, is not incompatible with Spinozism. He just didn't really, you know, speak of it. Didn't speak about creation either, of course, you know. Um, but yeah, no, I think modern Spinozism is just what we need at the moment. You know, interestingly, the foundation of deep ecology, deep ecological movement from Arn and S is also based on Spinozism, in, in, originally at least. Right. So, uh, so that's where metaphysics can be a practical benefit, I think, to uh, you know world situation. Right. Yeah, and you mentioned Ernst Haeckel as well, who I think coined the term biopsychism, which is a term I use more and more to differentiate kind of um, panpsychic views from ones where we just where life is thought to be kind of um, inherently tied up with consciousness. I've heard you use pan um, panpsychism in a kind of sometimes in that sense. Do you use it to mean that absolutely everything it ha is a kind of an instance of experience. Um, well, I I, I use panpsychism generally. 
I mean, pan experientialism is the is the word that people um, Griffin coined into for Whitehead. The reason being, psyche sometimes indicates the soul. In other words, indicates dualism, which is not necessarily the case for most panpsychisms. But I, you can use psyche like in psychology for you know for broader meanings. So I'm happy with that word. Um, I, what I, um, when I, when you say everything is conscious, I mean. So Bruno Giordano Bruno, he you know he um, 1500s, you know he he pointed out this division between aggregates and units, which are important. You know, so I I wouldn't think, for example, that this cup as a cup has a single form of sentience, um, but I consider that an aggregate, um, as opposed to uh, a unit of subjectivity. Now. But however, this is one of the big problems, more in my view than the so-called combination problem. This, um, the criteria by which one um, judges something to be a unit or a single unit of subjectivity is a very difficult question. I don't really know the answer to it. I mean, so, you know, you have like uh, Leibniz's monads, um, but they've got problems being windowless, for example. You've got an Arthur Kosler that speaks about holons, which is pretty good. Whitehead talks about actual entities, actual occasions. Um, and then, you know, you have the notion of autopoiesis, which is related to this, but it's insufficient, I think. I think it's a bit arbitrary with cell wall membrane. So um, this is still up for discussion. So, but anyway, that's one way in which I think not everything, if you talk about aggregates as conceptual units, um, these are not conscious per se. Of course, the units, self-sufficient units within a cup are, have a basic form of sentience, but I prefer the word sentience because it incorporates, you know, uh, it's crown consciousness, access consciousness, you know, focus, um, but all the way down to, you know, basic canatus, a sort of felt drive. Um, you know, related to what we call subconscious, perhaps. Also, I mean, um, there are certain things, for example, the past and the future, I wouldn't necessarily say are conscious. Uh, and this involves an analysis of what one means by that. And also, if one accepts what Whitehead calls eternal objects, which are somewhat akin to Plato's forms, which is not a very popular view today, um, but they are not neither conscious. So for Whitehead, although he's a pan-experientialist, he does have this eternal realm of eternal objects or universals or essences or forms, which um, is an aspect of his, his kind of panentheistic God. It's the N in panentheistic, which is non-conscious. Um, so I hold out, you know, it depends. And I'm, I'm not fully swayed either way by that, but um, so, um, you know, but ultimately, you know, if we, whether you're a universalist or not, um, or a nominalist, no one would say like a number is conscious, right? The concept of it, no matter its ontological status. So you have to be a bit careful when you say, I mean, pan does mean all, of course, but by all I mean all self-systematic actualities. You know? Right. I think that's a really, uh, a wonderful framework that you've, you've kind of laid out there because in conversations with panpsychism and pan-experientialism, some, sometimes it can just be kind of cast as everything is conscious. Yeah, as you say, a cup or, you know, I mean, few, few people believe, I guess, that things aggregated like a cup would be conscious, but it can be, I guess it's a kind of, it comes from a certain materialistic, um, materialist metaphysics where if we feel like stuff exists and then maybe all the stuff is conscious. Whereas with a kind of a process metaphysics, it feels to me like, you know, we exist at the kind of cutting edge of, of reality where, you know, in, in kind of Whitehead's framework, where you have all of this potential, all of the ways things could be collapsing into actuality, collapsing into kind of being certain ways. Um, and to me, I feel like that, that metaphysics is, even if you only think humans are conscious and it's because of our brains, I feel like it has to be, you almost need to include this Whiteheadian positioning of consciousness at this kind of cutting edge of existence. You know, we're living things that are, are really, um, yeah, living at this forefront of, of the unknown, of the potential and becoming actual. And a skeleton, which has become actual and is no longer engaging in this process, most of us would think a skeleton can't be conscious, but perhaps atoms or, you know, molecules, if, they, if they're self-organizing in the right way, that they could, could be considered these actual entities or whatever the, the term is you want to use. So I think that's a really nice um, way of framing it because it, it 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 kind of opens up the conversation to to everyone in the sense that the conversation can then become okay. Well, what are the systems that we can say have experience 
um, in this framework. Yeah, and that's, I mean, this is a difficult question. Of course, there's a science based on this, uh, well, related to this very much called um, integrated information technology, which you might be aware of, um, which is a form of panpsychism, essentially, like Christoph Koch has admitted, you know, um, developed by Tanoni, first of all, of course. Uh, so that's kind of mathematical way to, to um, decipher the integration of information, which then is inferred to be correlated to uh, uh, your levels of sentience. I mean, interest, I mean, it's a mathematical thing, essentially, but and it can't be proved, though, because with correlates, of course, you can't prove something except for yourself from having consciousness. So there's still, you know, still sort of leaves an open question. But um, I, I suppose it's sort of uh, why this sounds a bit mad to a lot of people still is, I think, because of mostly because of the Cartesian legacy, which has led to this view that the brain is uh, necessary and sufficient for sentience. And... And this is a kind of general emergentist view that we've had since the 1970s, really, as Jagon Kim says. And, uh, and this is an interesting uh, proposition, which interestingly can't be proved, you know, that the brain is necessary and sufficient for consciousness. We can, as you will know better than me, you know, of course, we can see correlates, although, correct me if I'm wrong, but that hasn't been fully mapped. And there's always anomalies, right? And the Lorber case and so on. And, um, but um, there's no real reason to think that Number one, the brain is necessary. In other words, there could be other integrated forms of information which um, are correlated to sentience. Also, I mean, we don't really know it's sufficient. Interestingly, I mean, that's another question which goes upwards. So um, when we talk about like these possibilities that we just spoke of, if you accept, I mean, what's the ontology? <laughs> I don't want to, what's the sort of, what are possibilities, you know, like, what, how do they exist? Um, and, or how do a mathematical theorems like Pythagorean theorem exist, you know? Um, it's, they seem to have an existence which is, um, which is not related to whether or not they've been thought. So the truth of, you know, the Pythagorean theorem sort of, it was always true whether or not people thought about them. When they do think of them, they become concepts which become temporal and they become actualized mentally at least. But um, it seems that, you know, in order to have um, entertain a lot of these concepts and for whitehead colors, qualia, even are forms of eternal objects, um, one then requires this kind of realm of possibility, um, which means that consciousness and having qualia and, you know, intellectual thoughts and whatnot, concepts, um, requires that. So that means the brain alone, again, as a physical thing, if we abstract it as a physical thing, wouldn't be sufficient for consciousness. Um, but of course, that depends on the metaphysics, this kind of uh, metaphysics of eternal objects once more. And this is, uh, you know, this has been a debate for, well, 3000 years, really, at least from Pythagoras, Plato, uh, through the medieval ages, nominalism versus, you know, realism, universalism. And even today in philosophy, it's, um, there's hybrid versions and it's not at all obvious. I mean, you know, prima facie, uh, for, first of all, you think, obviously, there cannot exist, um, you know, forms outside of time and space. But when you really look into the details, it doesn't become that obvious at all. There's good reasons to believe it. But again, it's hard to prove in any way. Right. And you mentioned earlier that, that this has a kind of bearing on the moral status of, uh, of different systems. So maybe if we take a, a, a turn into morality, uh, you've also written about what you call neo-nihilism. Perhaps you could uh, describe mm. that a bit for people. Okay. So this neo nihilism really is just a sort of amalgamation of um, thought of Hume, Nietzsche and Schopenhauer, but it also coincides, I've recently discovered afterwards with Spinoza really. Um, what I mean by this is the following, uh, essentially it means that there are no objective morals. So, so interestingly, you one can have um, a realm of forms without those forms being moral, like a form of the good or being normative in any sense. Um, but with neo-nihilism, it's, it's the view that they're, though they're, well, from a panpsychological view, the, the world is flooded with values, you know, value, uh, seeking of survival, also development, not just survival, you know, like expansion to a certain extent, um, that floods reality and the basis of, of, of uh, activity, essentially. However, these values, of course, can clash, uh, you know, my, my wanting to win the job might be go against someone else's wanting to win that job, for example, right? Uh, on a basic level. 
so these values don't need to be harmonious whatsoever. In fact, they're not. And then that's played out in you know the competition in the world. And sometimes they're in harmony and symbiosis. Sometimes they're in competition. This is this is the world. Um, so if there's no objective value, there's just this plurality of um, of, of subjective values. Um, it's impossible to say that one ought to do this or that, because when one says one ought to do something, of course, it implies that, you know, it implies this if clause. If one wants to achieve X, whatever that may be, then one ought to do that. If one wants to lose weight, one ought to eat less and so on. OK, but in, in terms of morality, um, an ought clause always really implies an if clause that is objective. Right. So if you want to be good, for example, if you want to be moral, but this on the sort of status of this good or this moral um, ultimately always implies a, um, a sort of objective transcendental morality. So something that Spinoza denies, Nietzsche denies, and the meta-ethicists of the 20th century, um, which means that an ought clause, when you say someone ought to do something, what you're really doing is imposing your will upon them. You say, what it really means is, you know, I want you to do what I want, um, even if that's saving the planet or whatever. Um, essentially, it's not a proposition that can be um, verified. And, and so therefore, what are you left with? You're left with subjective values. And that's what I mean by neo-nihilism. You know, there's ultimately subjective values. Um, and so you can have an ethics that is descriptive. You say people in this culture believe this and people in that culture believe that. But you can't say that this culture is somehow superior or inferior to the other one. So it's a little bit like cultural relativism. However, it goes beyond that by saying that you can't even say you shouldn't, um, you ought not to uh, criticize another culture. Because again, that's an ought clause, which ultimately implicitly relates to an objective standard, which I think cannot exist. Um, but you can have a virtue ethics through it, you know? So in order, this is Spinoza's great work of metaphysics, it's interesting, it's called the ethics, because he thinks that in understanding uh, this metaphysical picture of his, one achieves tranquility of mind. And this is like Aristotle again, you know, like to achieve a kind of flourishing in life, one has to sort of moderate one's emotions, uh, try to achieve, um, you know, pride and and uh, you know, happiness and so on and so forth. Um, and so morality then is all about um, how one achieves that. And of course, one often achieves happiness through harm, living in harmony with one's, with one's neighbors and also with the world and with the ecology for that matter. And of course, in the ecological sense, you can say it's in everyone's interest to do that. So it's in everyone's subjective value to save the planet, otherwise we're all good. <laughs> um, but ultimately, um, it, you know, it, it really means that when most people are moralizing, what they're really doing is trying to, they're, they're really trying to implement their own power status. You know, when you judge someone, you're putting yourself on a pedestal above them, as it were. And, um, and this is quite, yeah, this is quite a radical view, but um, if you don't believe that, then you have to prove, prove otherwise. And so you have, for example, you know, classically you have utilitarianism. Well, everyone, you know, you should do that, which brings about the most pleasure to most people and so on but you know you can just say why why is pleasure a good you know this is hard to prove why and why should you count everyone as equal i mean this is a legacy of christianity within in modern sort of secular ethics and so on so anyway i just made a quick case for that really it's yeah it distinguished descriptive from prescriptive morality uh, prescriptive being ought morality saying it's based on the transcendentalism uh, which i rejected and um but that still leaves one with values but it's just not no, there's just no overall objective values, which I think is really a legacy of Platonism and Christianity. Or, you know, as Nietzsche said, you know, Christianity is Platonism for the people. There's a strong interweaving of that. Of course, it does leave you in a certain abyss, and it leaves you excluded from many conversations, political conversations, and so on. You know, where, you know whether communism or capitalism is, you know, the way forward or whatever, what progress means, and so on. Um, but that, there you are. That's 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 where I am. Yeah, I, I share the uh, the belief that there can't be any kind of transcendental objective morality carved into the universe anywhere. Um, I think growing up Catholic will, will have that effect on you a lot of the time of feeling like, where are these Ten Commandments written down in the universe? You know, um, and then but I feel I feel um, the so you mentioned the, there's a, there's a plurality of perspectives, and I guess if someone says to you you ought to do this, sometimes what they're saying is you should do what I value, and usually what people value are aligned with their own their own goals, and so hence it being kind of a power thing. 
Um, but I guess my, my instinct is, um, I guess I'm interested, is there room in this framework for a, a kind of collective common um, subjective value? So if a group of humans, because they, they all have this will to survive, they all have a kind of revulsion to some extent of the concept of, of death. So collectively kind of not stored anywhere transcendentally, but just running on the software of their kind of collective minds. And, you know, there's this archetype of, of revulsion at death that you could get a, you could get a value of like, um, thou shalt not kill out of this kind of collective um, mm. commonality. Do you, do you see any room for that? Yeah, no, well, I mean, there's, there's obviously shared goals amongst groups, you know, like amongst humans, for example, with the, with the planet, saving the planet. However, um, again, I don't think that's, that might be human, there might be human, I, do, I don't actually think there's ab, uh, absolutely shared common human goals, I mean, but let's, there's probably, yeah, the fear of death is, is probably quite universal. Um, but of course, it might be in the interest and in subject of value of other other organisms for humans to die, you know, um, you know, especially at the moment, as you know. So, why would you then um, consider, from an objective point of view, humans as having more value than these other organisms or the ecological system as a whole? Again, you get you, you get into the same problem, and um, and so ultimately, even if every everything shared the same goal, it would still be based on subjective common values rather than any transcendental one. But I think in, in in reality that's not that's not shared. I mean, there are even people who, you know, the, the phenomenon of suicide, for example, means not everyone shares, uh, you know, the will to survive. Ultimately, there are perhaps greater values about um, quality of life, for example, or power, or something like this. You know, legacy. So um, ultimately, still, although you can, I mean, so if you know, if a group of us got together and we were on a sort of you know a stranded on an island. And you know, we all had one objective, one shared value to escape from that island. Then we could say, listen, we ought to do this. We ought to build this boat. We ought to, you know, create shelter. We ought to forage for food and so on. And and that would, that would work, and it would be in, in everyone's interest. Um, and that's what a lot of social morals and laws are based on. You know, this common interest. But ultimately, when it comes to questions, moral questions, where people disagree. Um, in other words, when people disagree, it means that there is no shared objective here. Like, for example, on abortion. Then, what is the appeal? You know, is it to? I mean, often it's often to an objective standard of morality. So, you know, Roman Catholics, for example, will appeal to a transcendent good, which is their God, for example, right? But if one rejects that, then where does that leave one? You know, if one even even um, appeals to like, you know, the sovereignty of um, a woman's body on the other side, you know, this is very hard to objectify really, you know, yeah, it's a preference of women, most women, maybe not all, but even that can't be, it's not an objective value that everyone shares. And so these debates ultimately are um, not questions of fact, but they just ultimately come to um, differences of subject evaluation. And so you sort of have to leave it at a certain level. Of course, you can make the case that there exist transcendental values, like, um, and that would then bring one into sort of theistic realms. But I'm, I'm you know, I don't personally go there. And this is yeah. really what, what Nietzsche meant by God is dead. You know, um, that, you know, if one really understands the consequences of not believing in God anymore, uh, then that really radically changes one whole, one's whole valuation of um, culture. And this is why he was a radical thinker and got into a lot of trouble. But he's influenced, of course, both the right and the left. You know, the right in terms of fascism, but the left in terms of power, understanding power relationships amongst different, you know, groups and so on. And uh, but 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 ultimately, uh, yeah, understanding that God is dead means there are no transcendental values. We we don't, we can don't have to inherit the Christian valuation that has is the legacy of the West, and that leads one to create one's own. Uh, values, which is quite emancipating in one way, quite terrifying in another way. Right. I don't disagree with um, with this uh, position for the, for the large part, but it's interesting that you mentioned that it can lead to a, a certain kind of difficulty in engaging in social projects, kind of engaging politically, you know it, because if you're taking political engagement to be kind of, this is what we ought to do, I'm going to fight for what I think is right in some kind of absolute sense, um, I can see why. But I, it makes me reflect on the 
I feel like more and more I see um, progress or whatever direction we should be moving in socially, I see it as a kind of health issue, you know, in the same way that if, uh, if, if you're suffering because you're, you have an undiagnosed condition that's causing you unnecessary suffering, then there, there can be healing work that can be done there. And in that in that situation, that in that framework, I think it seems to me to kind of sidestep this. Although it doesn't sidestep the value of, you could say health, but I guess really what I'm appealing to is freedom. I, I think there's a kind of, I think in the physics of being a living system, we we live in such a way that we want to not be dominated. And I mean, this also I guess fits in the the same um, the same framework because you know I guess you could say your own will to power is. You don't want someone else's will to power to kind of you know squash yours. Um, so I, I think I would hold that it's a common enough um, value in living systems that we want to maximize our own freedom. And if you can if you can engage in that project in a way of, of having the system flourish so that there's as little domination as possible and therefore as little kind of suffer, net suffering, I guess there's a bit of a utilitarianism coming in there as well. Um, yeah, that would be my my kind of framework, but it, it's it's good food for thought because this is this is not well, this is yeah. I mean, no, I was going to say that sort of coincides as well with Spinoza's ethics. Do you know that um, you know freedom for him is power ultimately as well. It's just you know not being dominated. It's having uh, internal agency, which has more effects than um, external agency uh, dominating one's behaviour. And this is yeah, this is the canatus essentially of, for Spinoza and what freedom means for him, even though it's determined. You know, even though that freedom is. That power is determined ultimately. Um, yeah, no, well, you know, I think, yeah, so I mean, I don't really see an inconsistency there. I was just saying this that often people don't know what's in their own interest, um, what's in their own, um, you know, interest to develop and survive. So, um, for example, people might be in a, in a political system where they're being exploited and they've been told that this is good for them and so on, you know. So maybe then in that case, reading Marx and Engels or something like that will actually emancipate them. And actually make them realize that you know if we can break down certain political systems then this is in their self-interest in fact maybe in most people's self-interest um and of course so um even from that subjective um call it you know some kind of um plur ethical plurality um you can still take on political positions because they are in the interest of you and your family and your friends for example you know they're not in the interest perhaps so in this particular case of certain entrepreneurs capitalists uh, capitalists and so on you know um so it's not universal still but nonetheless one would take on that position in one's one if one realizes that one is being exploited in that sense so you can i suppose you can still take on these political um positions and i must say that marx himself was kind of you know as i understand him at least quite um sympathetic to that viewpoint he talks about false consciousness he says that you know um i am a uh, you know this kind of um this this revolution of the proletariat is he's just being descriptive not prescriptive in other words he's you know explicit ex explicitly it says you know i'm not saying what ought to happen i'm saying what what will happen right because he understands this problem with oughts you know that schopenhauer pointed out uh, before nietzsche even you know schopenhauer even talks about slave morals you know before nietzsche so um i i, I mean it's a complicated issue but ultimately um it's uh you have to still realize that you're acting in your own not only in your own personal, it's not only egotistical, it's not only in your own interest, it could be the interest of your family, your group, your country, or your nation, your identity, whatever it may be, uh, which is another question related to, interestingly, whole on subjective units, you know, how one sort of right. identifies that. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and I, I'm interested in how this relates to psychedelic consciousness, because it seems to me, you know, we, we tend to see the world quite vividly through our stories, and we don't kind of imbue the world you know, objects around us with essences and we, we think things are fixed and permanent in some way. And the psychedelic consciousness can kind of show us how we're seeing the world through concepts and reality itself is not, not like that. And to me, that's synonymous with realizing that the reality really consists of a lot of different subjective perspectives. And there is, there is very little kind of objective ground. Um, so to me, that, that feels like there's a link there between what we've been talking about with neo-nihilism and psychedelics. Yeah, no, it's really fascinating. Yeah, and I've always meant to write this sort of link explicitly. It's a very interesting link because, for example, um, Bertrand Russell in his great essay, um, Mysticism and Logic, which I think is a useful uh, tool in the psychedelic canon, even though it's not ostensibly about psychedelics, um, he says that one of the four criteria of a mystical state is going beyond good and evil. 
So in other words, as you're saying, sort of um, somehow coming out of your cultural, your inculcation, looking down on your culture, its, its ideology, its morality and so on, and sort of judging it afresh. I think there's also perhaps the mechanism of uh, therapy and psychedelics that you see yourself afresh. You see that your worries, your little worries are really trivial in comparison to the cosmos as a whole or something like this, you know. And uh, so, so Bertrand Russell wrote about this. Octavio Paz and Nobel Laureate wrote about this as well, explicitly about psychedelic drugs, that they take one beyond good and evil and he even incorporates Nietzsche, this was in the 1950s. Um, but this is kind of lost in modern, um, modern uh, literature, it seems. Um, but, you know, also this is very, you know, this, this relates very interestingly to um, a debate that I've, that we had in, so I'm doing this master's course in Exeter on philosophy and psychedelics at the moment. And one of the um, lessons was on this debate between perennialism and contextualism in psychedelic experience. So for those who don't know, you know, uh, perennialism epitomized by Aldous Huxley is the view that um, um, all religions and all psychedelic states at their peak, at the peak experience, if there, you know, which they assume there is, um, are the same, but the interpretations of that differ amongst culture and amongst people. As opposed to contextualists, um, uh, this view was inaugurated by Stephen Katz in the 1970s, which is the view that even the experience itself, psychedelic experiences and mystical experiences themselves, are completely conditioned by one's culture. So, um, you know, in the West, we would see sort of a unio mystica following sort of Judeo-Christian tradition infused by the East in the 20th century. Whereas in the um, indigenous American communities, um, one wouldn't have that because one doesn't have the cultural legacy. One would see snakes and jaguars and so on and so forth instead. And uh, I think this is a very interesting question um, because essentially the question is, um, can psychedelics decondition one from um, culture, like going beyond good and evil and so on, or are they or the experiences completely conditioned by culture? And of course, there are hybrid views, you know. So, I mean, you know, one, one would have to say, you know, one's personal life you know, memories that occur in psychedelic experiences must be conditioned by one's inculcation, one's, one's culture, obviously, and the language concepts one uses. Um, however, I think there are certain experiences, like extreme experiences, for example, occasioned by 5-AMEO-DMT, which I know you've um, uh, spoken a lot about, haven't you? Um, that I would be surprised if they were culturally, fully, totally culturally conditioned. Um, because they, number one, uh, they often do not include concepts or language um, or memories, you know, and uh, they seem to be completely alien to one's culture. The same applies to, you know, high dose LSD and so on and so forth, I suppose. And also, of course, other drugs like cocaine and heroin, you wouldn't expect them to have completely different um, effects in different cultures. You know, you expect something similar, at least, you know, sort of something excitatory or, or whatever it may be, you know. So, um, but it's an interesting debate and it, the, there's no proper research done on it really. You need to sort of have anthropological and metaphysical um, researchers combined in such a study. Yeah, hopefully that's an exciting research program for the future. <laughs> yeah, so thanks so much, Peter. This has been really great. Um, perhaps you could share the name of your book again and where people can go if they want to look into your work. Uh, where can people go? Well, um, well, I've got my uh, book out, Modes of Sentience by Psychedelic Press. It's coming out in a few weeks. Um, hardback, limited edition, first of all. That's on the Psychedelic Press website. Um, we've got a, a book uh, coming out from with Bloomsbury, um, an edited volume on psychedelics and philosophy, coming out in a few months. Um, that's on the Bloomsbury website then, and in all book, you know, in all good bookshops, hopefully. Um, otherwise, my website is philosopher.eu philosopher.eu and I'm on Twitter, Peter Shuster H and elsewhere. And um, I'm based at Exeter University where we have really, you know, we have um, undergraduate and master's modules in this. We have a really fascinating colloquium with the psychology department or Celia Morgan's psychology department there. She's a world leading expert in um, ketamine. And so we're sort of working together there. And um, yeah, there's, and there's a conference coming out in maybe next year and all kinds of things going on really, yeah. So Great. lots of good stuff to look into. If you want to get in touch? Yeah, philosopher.eu, that's the main one. Great, thanks again. Thank you, James.
Thanks for listening. If you're watching on YouTube, please like and subscribe. And if you want to help the podcast reach a wider audience, you can leave a review on Apple Podcasts. Finally, if you want to offer financial support, you can go to patreon.com forward slash Dr. James Cook.